Hi everybody and welcome to our webinar on the Northeast Cambridge Area Action Plan. Hopefully you can all see us. Um, we're really glad that you've joined us for, for this webinar on homes and, and also the community facilities that come with them. Just a little bit of housekeeping and so forth. Um, I'm Hannah Loftus, I am one of the team working on the North East Area Action Plan and I've been leading on a lot of the consultation and engagement work. I'm going to chair this, I've got a great panel of my colleagues from, from policy and from other teams across the councils who've been involved. Uh, it's an hour long, it is on this topic and so the people we've got here are, um, are particularly um, involved with that topic. We have got some other webinars coming up as well on other topics so if there's something that you can't get answered here please do feel free to join us. The webinar is being recorded and we'll be putting it up on the YouTube channels for both councils as well. Um, so you can share that as well and, and revisit at any time. For that reason, when we read out your questions, we won't be reading out your names with them before GDPR reasons. And just to reassure you that you also won't, your names won't be visible in the recording of the webinar either. So I'm just going to quickly ask my colleagues to introduce themselves one by one, just so you know who everyone is who we've got here today. Maybe I'll start with, with Matt, with you. Hi, all. I'm Matt Patterson. I'm the project lead for developing the Area Action Plan on behalf of the Shared Planning Services. And Julian? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Julian Sykes. I'm a principal planning policy officer and I've been project managing the Northeast Cambridge Area Action Plan. And Terry? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Terry D'Souza. I'm Principal Planning Policy Officer at the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service, and I've been working on the Area Action Plan and the evidence-based documents that underpin it. And last person from our, our policy team, Marco. Hi all, I'm Marco Picardi. Um, I work in the policy team with the others and um, with the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service. And then we also have um, Julie from South Cairns. Hello everyone, I'm Julie Fletcher, I'm Head of Housing and Strategy for South Cambridgeshire District Council. And Julian, I can see we're going to have two Julians and a Julie, so this is going to get really interesting when we're doling out the questions. Julian Adams this time. Hello, I'm Julian Adams, I'm a Growth Projects Officer with the Cambridge City Council. I work across various services, but I sit within Strategic Housing. And Rob Lewis. Hi, I'm Rob Lewis. I'm from the County Council. I'm the Lead Officer for Planning and Commissioning Education Provision. And lastly, we have Hannah and Joe, who are part of our team on comms and engagement, helping run the whole show here today. So thank you very much. We're just going to do a really kind of quick overview presentation of some of the themes and issues around housing and, and community facilities. I'm sure some of you will have had a look at some of the material that's online as part of the consultation, but we're aware that not maybe everyone has. So I'm just going to hand over to Terry, who's going to talk you through some of the kind of headlines um, from the area action plan that we're consulting on. Thank you, Hannah. Um, wait for the presentation to come up. I should say that you can put in Q&A's at any point, questions in the Q&A panel at any point, and we will answer them um, after the presentation. Great. Thank you, Joe. I'm just going to turn my camera off just to, um, hopefully my audio will be, will be a bit better. Okay. Can you, can you start the, sh the slideshow, Joe, please? I think it's on, um, thank you. So, um, so yeah, the Northeast Cambridge Area Action Plan. So uh, the area is shown in orange on that plan um, is 180 hectares. Uh, it is in um, it is adjacent to the um, A14, the um, guided busway, um, as well as the um, Cambridge to Ely railway line. It includes Cambridge North Station and stretches all the way across um, Milton Road into Cambridge Science Park and also Cambridge Regional College. Um, previously, the area did include bramble fields and the Nuffield Road allotments, but we have taken that out um, following the last round of consultation last year. Um, the area's got really good accessibility um, to the local area. 
um, and wider, so trans, uh, in terms of trains, a guided busway, uh, and it's only 15 minutes on, on, on your bike from um, Cambridge City Centre, so really good access to a whole host of services and local facilities. Um, there are a range of landowners in, in the area, um, including some of the colleges like St John's and Trinity, uh, and also um, the City Council, amongst others. So the, the purpose of the Area Action Plan is to try and coordinate development um, within this area. Um, it's also a really important site strategically, thinking about not only Greater Cambridge, but also much wider than that in terms of um, the Oxford to Cambridge arc. And one of the key things that's really important about the Area Action Plan that we think um, is that local communities must really benefit from, from development um, that happens in this area. Um, it should address local deprivation and it should really integrate with the surrounding communities. So that includes Milton um, and, and communities to the south, um, in, such as King Hedges and even places like Abbey, uh, which will be connected to this area with the Chisholm Trail and other infrastructure that goes in. Next slide, please, Joe. Sorry, I've got a, I don't know if I've got a lag or whether it's... No, it's, I'm not sure it's working quite. There we go. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, what is an area action plan? So it's a planning framework to guide development. It's essentially like a local plan, but it's a site-specific one. So there are a number of policies within it, um, and all of those have, have to be justified by evidence. So I think at the moment we're up to around 53 different pieces of evidence, um, documents that, that sit behind this area action plan. And it has to go through two rounds of public consultation. This is this being the first one, and there's another one uh, which will which will take place in the future, before it goes to examination for um, a, pu a public hearing, um, where it will be assessed by an independent planning inspector. So it uh, you know it carries the same the same sort of weight as a local plan. So it's a really important planning document for this area. Okay, so the vision for North East Cambridge, I'm sure a few of you have seen this already. So we want North East Cambridge to be an inclusive, walkable, low carbon new city district with a lively mix of homes, workspaces, services and social spaces, which is fully integrated with surrounding neighbourhoods. So some key headline figures. So as I said, um, it's about 182 hectares of brownfield land. That's actually bigger than Cambridge city centre. So it's a significant, it's a really significant site. It's the equivalent of walking from the beehive centre all the way through to the backs. So it's, it's, quite, a, it's quite a large area. There are 15,000 jobs on the site at the moment, but there are only three homes and they're actually within the sewage treatment site. Um, there are around 4,400 unused car parking spaces on Cambridge Science Park. Um, so there's quite a lot of scope there um, to, um, to intensify uh, development and make better use of the land. And in the future, we're looking at around 8,000 new homes, um, which will be about 18,000 residents, and 40% is the target for new affordable housing, which is a, one of the topics that we're talking about today. Uh, we think there'll be, an, therefore, an uplift of around 20,000 new jobs, and, and there'll be a range of sectors, sectors not just um, R&D, uh, an office space, and um, new, new provision of open spaces and parks, three new primary schools, a new library, as well as an imp improved um, connections, walking and cycling um, through and into and around the, around the area. So as I said, there's around 8,000 new homes uh, and that's about 18,000 people. Um, most of these will be on the east side of Milton Road. So that will be the land between Cambridge North Station and Milton Road. Um, and we're aiming for 40% affordable housing, of which 60% we're intending to be social affordable rent. Um, this, this slide here just shows kind of where those are sort of distributed across the area. Um, one of the key things here is that we're looking to take out a lot of the industrial uses that are in uh, Nuffield Road at the moment and relocate those to Cowley Road. Um, so hopefully it would be a, a sort of a better solution in that area um, in terms of um, less kind of HGVs and white vans going past the, um, the Shirley School and things like that. Uh, we're really keen to create a mixed and balanced community here as well. So this isn't just about, you know, young kind of professionals who, you know, maybe have just finished their university courses and looking for somewhere to, to, to rent. You know, we're really looking for a mix, of, a mix of people to live in this area. So as I said, 40% affordable housing, but that can include, um, you know, um, social rented, council rented, shared ownership, key worker housing, build to rent self finish, which is a really different type of um, house um, housing type that we're looking at here, as well as conventional market sale. 
so um, a real a real mix and also um, we're trying to limit um, Airbnbs and, and similar types of, of um, sort of um, visitor accommodation in this area um, because it's been a real issue uh, particularly within um, the city for quite some time now uh, and we really want to make sure that we're not just creating homes but homes that are really high quality and that will that will last um, sort of the test of time really so making sure that we have really good internal and external space standards for all of those new homes But it's not just homes. Um, this isn't a housing development. This, this is far from it. It, it. What we're really trying to do is create a really, truly um, mixed use community here um, where you can just walk to get to your sort of day to day local services and facilities. Um, so be that a library or, you know, your, your sort of you know, weekly or daily food shop um, or whether it's um, those social social places where you go and meet friends and colleagues after work, or whatever it is. It, that, that's really what we're trying to create in North East Cambridge. At the moment, if you go into the area, it is it is a nine to five place. You know, you go there on a on a Saturday or a Sunday, or even you know beyond six o'clock in the evening. It, you know, it, it is pretty a pretty soulless place to be fair. Um, and and we really really want to change that. And that's one of the things that's really driving the kind of mix of uses um, that that we're looking at for North East Cambridge. So you can see there are four centres um, in the area. One is a district centre, which is on Cowley Road. So broadly speaking, it's where the uh, golf driving range is at the moment. Um, and then three smaller centres, two local ones, one at Cambridge North Station and one at the Science Park, which would be opposite CRC. Um, so really try and um, uh, have a kind of like a forward face to, to, the, to the area, that area. So people who live in Kings Hedges and Orchard Park and CRC, who go to CRC can actually use the facilities in that area and then a smaller neighbourhood centre up at Cowley Road opposite St John's Innovation Park. Uh, and in terms of the shops, we're really trying to encourage smaller shops and businesses. So this isn't a kind of a, a shopping, um, uh, you know, a shopping centre or anything like that. You know, we, what we're trying to create is kind of what's been successful in the city at the moment. So if you think of that somewhere like Mill Road or Mitcham's Corner, it, you know, there, there are a lot of smaller independent um, uses, um, uses down there uh, in those areas. And you know, that, that, that really adds to the kind of richness, richness of Cambridge. And that's something that we really, really want to see moving forward. So, you know, we're not, we're not looking at, you know, big kind of um, retail warehouses or Ikeas or anything like that. It's a, it's a, lot, it's a lot smaller scale. But one, one that is kind of appropriate to the size of, of the development that we're proposing. And so just to get us started, um, we've, had, we've had a number of questions actually on uh, social media and through emails already on the Area Action Plan. Um, and some of them relate to the topic that we're talking about today in terms of homes and facilities. Um, so we've got three questions lined up uh, pre kind of um, pre-recorded questions lined up really. Um, so we've got some colleagues that are going to answer those. I think Marco's going to pick up the first one, which is what kind of homes are included in the 40% affordable housing category? Sure, thanks, Terry. Um, yeah, so the 40% affordable housing will be a sort of range of mix uh, that will mix a lot of different tenure types. Um, that will include social and council homes to rent, uh, intermediate housing, and low cost um, home ownership, that, including shared ownership. Um, we expect that around, uh, well, that a minimum of 60% of the affordable homes will be social or affordable rent. Uh, so that means housing that's currently set at social and or affordable rents uh, to provide a, a balanced mix in the area, as you say, um, that is appropriate to meet the, the vision of the AAP, but also prioritizing this tenure. Um, we would like to see appropriately sized affordable housing tenure and this will be based on an assessment of unmet housing need based on the latest evidence and the existing supply of affordable housing in the local area. Um, what was key for us, I think, as, as you said, Terry, uh, you know, the, the design led ambition of the, of the plan is that affordable housing is not to be visually distinguishable from market housing by its external appearance or by the space standards that it adopts. Um, and so it's key that this will be well integrated and distributed across the site in groups of affordable homes and um, that it's not confined to less prominent parts of the site. Um, and so it's also 
key to, to acknowledge that the respective Cambridge City Council and South Cam's District Council um, housing allocation policies determine the eligibility requirements. So that includes key worker housing categories for accessing um, affordable housing via the respective housing registers. So we recommend feeding back formally on the housing allocations policies when these consultations become available um, as promoted via our respective council websites. We also encourage everyone to feedback uh, their suggestions in relation to affordable housing via this consultation. Um, and the best place is section six, jobs, homes and services, policy 13B, affordable housing and policy 13D, housing for local workers. So that, that's me done. Apologies for my gravelly voice. I'm just coming off uh, sickness. Thanks, Mr. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, gone. <laughs> the next question is about the health facilities, and I, I think um, Julian Adams is going to answer this one because that's always a, a really interesting one that comes up from communities to say, well, it's all very well building the houses, but you know, what about the stuff that comes with that? I think it's. I think Julian Sykes. I think it's actually me, Julian Sykes, that uh, responded to this one. Um, so, yes, um, this is an important consideration for the, the site, especially when you've got so many residents plus um, a large number of employees uh, in, in the area. So, to reflect the importance of this, we produced a health and well-being topic paper, which will be available on websites for people to look into more detail. Um, however, particularly in relation to the, the health facilities, you appreciate the NHS has had to focus on the, the COVID-19 crisis. So some of the discussions uh, in this respect aren't as advanced as they are on, on other topic areas. More recently, however, the, the NHS has had a bit more capacity and, and we are now having active discussions with them on what sort of provision could be um, to, to, for, for the area. The, in, the issue indications are that this, there's likely to be a significant um, facility on the site, um, not a hospital as such, but uh, uh, a major district facility that probably would go in the district centre that could provide a range of primary, secondary and social services um, for the community. Now the size, timing and the range of those services are going to be the subject of further discussions um, and the NHS need to provide us with further advice on this but um, you can be sure that we, we are keen to provide appropriate um, facilities in this area for such a large community um, and to um, coordinate them with existing provision uh, in the neighbouring areas. Um, we'd welcome any thoughts that people have on the health needs of the community in there because they can then be fed into the, those discussions and into the future work we do on the AAP. So thank you very much. Thank you Julian. Um, and then the final uh, pre-prepared question was um, is about schools and uh, where will the three primary schools be located in the district and how will people travel there? That's a really good question. So um, so I think it's Matt who's answering that one. Yeah, it is. Uh, I think I had a, a map as well that went with this one. We got that? Yeah, there it is. So the schools, the primary schools are shown on the map in, in the um, purpley colour, if you like. Um, primarily, they're located to be well served by the housing developments in and around the area, and therefore within easy walking distance, really, of each of those. Um, what we are looking at is whether we need uh, secondary school provision as well. Um, so one of the sites is also capable of accommodating secondary school provision, um, but we will also look at improving links into and out of NEC to ensure that uh, should children here require access to secondary schools outside of the area, that they are easily accessible by cycling and walking as well. But those are the key locations. Uh, again, we welcome people's comments on those, but obviously what we've sought to do is ensure they are still part and parcel of at the heart of the communities, really, for those areas, um, which will be predominantly the residential areas within the NEC. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, just to clarify, it's the three kind of navy squares that were shown on that map. Um, <laughs> 
yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, but if, uh, yeah if, you, if, you, um, if anyone wants to look at that in further detail, then yeah, there's um, obviously it's in the area action plan document itself, so you'll be able to um, have a look at that in a, with a bit more time. But thank you, Matt. Hannah, over to you. Thank. So we've got some questions coming in on the Q and A, which we'll we'll start to answer. And obviously, please do keep asking questions um anything that comes up along the topics so the first question uh, well actually the first two questions which are related are about this 40 percent target for affordable housing and if a developer comes forward with a planning application for a parcel and then claims a viability exclusion are we powerless to actually make the 40 percent happen the, the follow-up to this is as a planning authority you can only comment and approve or refuse the application in front of you, not the one you want the developer to submit. Well, actually, the team have been working, I think one of the things to say here is the team have been working really hard with landowners in the area to make sure it is a collaborative approach from day one. Um, and I think Matt maybe is going to pick up on just some of that because he's been very involved with those negotiations. Yeah, um, and certainly the expectation of government at the moment is that uh, the planning process itself is the key test of viability rather than the individual development. So we have to ensure that what we propose in policy is viable. So we are, we've commissioned viability consultants to undertake an assessment to ensure that that um, affordable housing target is deliverable. And therefore the full expectation will be that when development comes forward, uh, they won't be able to query that uh, unless there are very exceptional circumstances. Um, and that may be something along the lines of uh, there's something in the ground really that requires um, significant decontamination or something like that that will add to the cost or something like that that may, um, uh, may impact the viability of the scheme, in which case it's a consideration for the local planning authority as to what type of obligations we may uh, seek in terms of whether it's a reduction in affordable housing or whether we um, reduce other requirements on the development and maintain the level of affordable housing. Um, so in that regard, the planning authority does have the ability always to um, approve or refuse an application if it's not in accordance with what we want to see come forward for NEC. Um, and certainly we would um, ensure that anything that came forward was uh, in line with the, the vision for the area, the strategic objectives. We have to consider each on their case and on their merit but in the whole, we would expect development to be in full accordance with what we want to see. Thanks very much, Matt, for that. Um, we also have some other questions that have been asked via social media and so forth. And one of the questions that has been coming up quite a lot is around the types of homes that will be built and, and whether it will be mostly flats or will it be family homes and that kind of thing. Um, I'm, I'm wondering whether maybe um, Marco, is there something you might want to talk to briefly? Um, briefly, yeah. Um, yeah, I think the densities that are being looked at at NEC, as Matt mentioned, there's a, there's a viability process that we've commissioned, um, tends to favour flat to development. Um, but Hannah, I think what you've said there is a kind of contradiction in terms because I don't think that there's necessarily family homes and flats are mutually exclusive. Um, and so I think one of the key things that um, we're trying to address in the policies, if you look at them, is to ensure that there are high design standards for flats to include. And we know now through the COVID times and um, lockdown how important having uh, good amenities and um, indoor spaces so there are things like all flats will need to uh, look into dual aspect being dual aspect and having um, some kind of uh, balcony space um, so yes while while they the majority of homes on the site are foreseen to be flats or apartments um, they are still uh, aiming to be on the policies intend for them to be as, as high quality homes as possible to ensure that family living and all kinds of different types of living can, can occur on site. 
Th thanks, Marco. And actually, there's a question on the Q&A that is a, a bit of a follow on from this in the sense of the design questions around flats. It says the blocks of flats that are on the plans are so tall and these have so many problems like wind tunnels and lack of private spaces, etc. This doesn't seem at all attractive. Well, I think it's an interesting point around the question around heights and I, I maybe Terry, actually, because I know you've been working a lot with, with John and the urban design team on some of these questions. Would you like to just pick up on that? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, so we've, we've, we've done quite a bit of work already on building heights. Um, so we, we've carried out some work looking at the, the wider landscape character and seeing um, um, what development you could achieve at North East Cambridge without having a negative impact on the wider sort of landscape. So uh, consultants went out to places like Ben Ditton um, and Horningsea and places like that to, to, to sort of try and understand uh, what development could uh, could be achieved at North East Cambridge. Now, um, we are doing some follow up work to that where we're going to start looking at what impact tall buildings will have on the heritage of the city um, and the kind of key views from elsewhere. So kind of thinking about um, the areas to the south of the city and the hills. Um, and, and that's a piece of work that we're doing at the moment. And Historic England are actually working, uh, are helping us with with that piece of work. So um, so where we are with building heights at the moment is we're saying that around the edges of the site, um, you know, it can achieve kind of four to five storey, and then you could um, increase that gradually up towards the centre of the site. Um, but like I said, we're doing some further work with that. So that's kind of, a, this is where we are at this stage of the process. And actually, as the evidence comes through, um, that, that, that kind of approach may need to be tweaked slightly depending on what that evidence is saying. But we do actually have another Q&A webinar specifically on, I forgot the name of it now, I think it's, is it density and design or design and building heights, something along those lines, next Wednesday evening. So if you wanted to talk to myself and Matt, who's going to be there, and colleagues from Urban Design, then that's probably a really good opportunity to ask some more questions on that topic. I think just to follow up on, on some of the points raised there, you know, what we are aware that it's a different kind of development from what has been seen historically in some parts of Cambridge in the past. You know, it is slightly more, if you like, urban. And I think this is where the vision of a city district that has that really vibrant, really lively feel where the public realm is really generous um, is really important. And of course, not everybody will want to live you know, in, a, in a place like that, but also not everybody wants to live in a suburb with, you know, uh, you know a car where you only can get anywhere by using a car and so forth. So it is about trying to create something that's an appealing lifestyle choice for people um, and has everything on your doorstep. You don't need to use a car if you don't want to. Um, and it, it does bring some of that more, if you like, urban, almost continental style living to Cambridge. Um, just a couple of other questions that are coming up on the chat here. Um, so there's a question around factory building. I think this is a, it's an interesting one. Homes England have a parcel of North Stowe phase two being entirely factory built as part of the government's policy to encourage this to happen, especially given the shortage of building skills in an expanding area like Greater Cambridge. Can the AAP include a requirement for factory building as a means of quick and cheap and better insulated dwellings? Um, I wonder who might be the best person to speak to that, Matt, waving? Yeah, it's me. So yeah, we've been talking with the developers and they're very keen, um, in particular uh, on the core site, the, the Anglian Water site, uh, looking at modular build. So um, essentially putting up a factory and doing modular build. Um, making use of the aggregates rail head as well to bring in uh, the materials necessary, uh, limiting HGV movements on the surrounding road networks and things like that. Also, you've got the concrete batching plant, so it all kind of works together. Um, and then we've been talking with Cambridge Regional College as well about putting a training facility on the side of that uh, to ensure we can upskill um, those uh, local workforce um, to ensure they have access to apprenticeships and job training in the construction industry that can make use of that facility in terms of um, it, it'll be there for the long term in terms of a build out. Um, and therefore, it, it all seems to work quite nicely together. So, yes, we are definitely looking at um, on site provision for a um, sort of modular build facility. Thank you, Matt. Um, there's a, a question also about um, the, the ground rents and service charges in development. The question says, 
Um, given that flats will likely be a majority of housing in the area, is there any plans to limit developers' proposed ground rents and service charges? These seem to have been hiking uncontrollably in recent uh, developments. Matt, I have a funny feeling this might be a good one for you as well, sorry. It's fine. Yeah, and certainly on service charges, we are looking at how we can limit those um, in particular. Certainly on affordable housing blocks, we've been managing to limit the service charging that applies to those. And we are obviously looking to do that as well, where you've got um, uh, blocks of flats that are in um, uh, even market housing as well. The ground rents is slightly more difficult in that it's not really a planning matter and it's quite difficult for us, but it's an issue that we are obviously discussing with the government around uh, whether they can put a cap on that as well to facilitate um, uh, or help people with their, their just their costs of living really, which are extremely high normally and yeah, ground rents don't help with that. So we are obviously looking at all the ways and means. Part of that is looking at how we do our developments as well and ensuring they're as sustainable as possible. And that means ensuring actually the cost of um, maintaining the development over the long term is reduced as well. And hopefully that's reflected in a much reduced service cost to anyone. I'm aware that one of the things that we get asked a lot um, is about affordable housing and what that actually means. We were at a community event the other day in, in North East Cambridge in actual fact our first in-person consultation since COVID. It was really exciting to talk to real people um, in person um, and that came up a lot and I was wondering whether Julie you might just be able to unpack because affordable can mean something colloquially and of course our government tells us it means something slightly different um, technically. Yep, no problem. So obviously so affordable housing can mean different things for different people really in terms of what their affordability is. Um, so in terms of our affordable provision, we are looking for 60% to be either affordable rent or social rent. So uh, and as part of that, the council, Cambridge City Council will be looking to deliver some of that affordable housing themselves as council housing. So typically, um, sort of social rents will be between 50 to 60 percent of a market rent, whereas an affordable rent is slightly higher at sort of 60 to 75 percent of a market rent. But for those that are on real low incomes, obviously there is the housing benefit that will help to sort of help those lower household incomes. So that is our highest priority, really, in terms of helping those on the lowest incomes. But we do also recognise that for many people now who are on sort of average incomes, affordability is still a huge issue for them, that they can't access the um, sort of housing market for um, buy a home. Um, so that's why we are also really keen to look at different tenure types within the affordable provision. Um, so we're looking at um, potentially rent to buy, so maybe people, young professionals, who can't afford to buy their home yet, but their career will progress. So they can start by renting at a lower rent with the ambition to purchase that property at a later stage. There's also shared ownership, which is a part buy, part rent product. So that helps people who can't access mortgages very easily. They will get a lower mortgage for say 50% share and then they'll pay rent on the other half. Um, discounted market also is another option for maybe those at the higher sort of level on the medium incomes who want to purchase their own house but can't quite afford it. Um, so really I think what we're saying is affordability, we're, we're very aware that we need to provide for those on the lowest incomes but we also need to have that spectrum across the range really. Affordability also comes in terms of the design and the location of the property. So to be truly affordable, um, we want to cut down on travel costs to work by um, maybe having some sort of local lettings plans to make sure we prioritise people who work locally um, to ensure that their costs are cut down in travel and also by sort of energy efficiency so their utility costs are lower as well. So we will look at all of that in terms of the housing mix. And I think when we do look at affordable housing in terms of the overall mix, Again, it's about getting that balance right within the whole of the community so we don't have high concentrations of one particular tenure type in one area so that it's a cohesive and balanced um, community. So I hope that sort of answers the question. 
Yeah, thank you. I mean, it is a very complex area housing, unfortunately, for something that is a, a basic need that we all have. It does come in, in many different shapes and sizes um, and, and it does change all the time. I'm just going to go on to the question around schools and so forth. And a question for, for Rob, which is, um, will the primary schools include nursery provision? Because obviously young families, people may be coming in um, to the development with very young children in the first instance, um, who then may progress up the school system. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, the council policy and the approach will be to have preschools on each of the primary school sites um, and they will offer sessional provision for two, three and four year olds meeting the national uh, free entitlement. Um, we know that these won't be sufficient to meet all the need and certainly not full daycare provision. So we'll be looking to secure within the section 106 agreements um, sites to be coming for to be uh, marketed for full day care provision and also we'll look to work with you know, the councils and community provision to look at what op opportunities may exist for sessional preschool provision within other community facilities. Thanks very much Rob. Um, just on the other community facilities, questions people have been asking about what kind of sports facilities and other community facilities will be available. And I know there's also been some work that we've been doing on cultural provision as well. Um, who might like to answer this one next? Uh, uh, Matt? Yeah, that's fine. So, yeah, we have been working, obviously, with um, uh, local communities and, and we've been going out. We've got some consultants involved in... Um, undertaking an assessment of what's already within the local area, what people like in terms of those existing facilities, where they think there's deficiencies and things like that. And so we're looking at the widest range of different types of community facilities from um, halls, obviously, to library provision, to um, sports facilities and the like, um, right through to different types of open spaces as well. Um, and we're looking at what's within the surrounding area that, that people like and we could improve upon uh, and what where there are deficiencies even in the surrounding communities, whether they can be provided for within NEC, because part of this is knitting NEC into the surrounding community much better and easier by walking and cycling and making those strategic connections and ensuring um, residents within new residents coming into NEC can access facilities that are within the surrounding area and likewise existing residents can come and use the new facilities that will be provided. So it's about a, a holistic view to um, what kind of community facilities are needed in the wider area to benefit the broadest community really. I think this is a really good one for people to feed back to us on as well as part of the consultation you know we really want to hear uh, whether you think uh, we've got the mix right of community facilities what you know residents of the surrounding areas know the area the best themselves so your best place to say what do you really think uh, that, that could be usefully provided at North East Cambridge that would fill a gap and wouldn't duplicate what's already well provided for in the area around it. Um, just looking at some other questions coming through here, um, there's a question around um, communal recycling and, and electric power points and things like that, so really some of the sustainability side that comes with um, housing. I wonder whether Marco, I know you've been doing some work on some of the smart stuff as well, whether you might want to just talk a little bit about that? Um. Yeah, I, I don't know if I've got the detail off hand, uh, but I'll, I'll try my best. Uh, yeah, I think as uh, as, been, as Terry outlined in, in the vision for um, the Northeast area, Northeast Cambridge Area Action Plan, a key key part of it is, is creating this sustainable, how can we create development in the most sustainable manner possible? Um, and so we are exploring ways to try and consolidate um, refuse collection um, so that uh, in high density locations we have a single single point uh, collection places where um, the rubbish is, is taken um, not not in various locations but a strategic locations where a, a refuse vehicle can access without disturbing uh, the multiple residential streets and that it can happen you know uh, once a day or something um, 
And what was the second part of the, the question? Sorry. Um, public electric PowerPoints for cars and electric scooters. All right. I don't I don't have the detail of that. I'll pass over to Matt, yeah. <laughs> I can do that. I mean Sorry. the expectation here is that um, for the government all vehicles will be electric by i think it's 2030 even or is it later i think but e either way um we are looking at 100 percent electric provision across the site in terms of um that's the future trend so we need to ensure we've got the energy supply the battery storage and all the other things to facilitate both uh, electric vehicle but e-scooter e-bike all the other electric gadgets that will be necessary to provide um, sustainable modes of transport as well. So um, certainly charging points will be um, uh, a key um, requirement for all sort of parking spaces, whether that's for bikes, cargo bikes or cars. And I think again, you know, we're really keen to hear people's views on things like this and what people are. I did see one comment on social media, I think a week or two ago about, for instance, mobility scooters and how mobility scooters will be catered for. And the more people talk to us about what your needs are or specific user requirements, the more we can assure that that is built in because this is just a draft plan at this stage for consultation. And we know we've got a lot more work to do um, to make sure to when it gets to the, the full plan. Just got a follow up on Julie, your affordable housing, obviously a um, very good answer. And then the next question is, well, how do people apply for council homes in this area once it's built? Okay, so um, for all sort of council homes and also housing association properties, so all sort of social and affordable rent, um, it goes through our home link scheme, which is a choice based letting scheme that's administered across the whole of the sub region, actually, within Cambridge here. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to put a link as a follow up so that people can, if they want to apply, I would say apply now because um, the earlier you get an application in, the better really. And then how it works is when properties become available, they're advertised and people that qualify for those properties can actually sort of express an interest in them so that there's an element of choice in terms of what properties that they want to apply for. So I, yeah, I would definitely say if people are interested then it's better to register early and then um, you're ready and waiting for whenever the homes might come on board. So I'll send that link after um, this webinar. Thanks, Julie. Um, just a question around co-housing opportunities. I know we've sort of briefly touched on some of these other forms of housing um, earlier, but will, do we expect there to be some opportunities for those sorts of housing? And maybe just Julian, is this one, you, Julian Adams, maybe have something to come in on? Yeah, so we know that um, uh, we have had some interest around the City and South Cams regarding self-build and co-housing. Um, it, it is something that we've put into our topic paper for housing for the NEC in terms of uh, self and custom build. And we know that the Greater Housing Strategy has 5% of all new builds allocated for these modes. But with the, with the constraints and the restrictions around the type of housing and densities that we have at NEC, it's probably more towards uh, two or three percent for a custom build or custom finish. Um, the issue around self build is also intrinsically linked to quite obviously land and the provision of land and uh, the prohibitive costs that we all know about within Cambridge. So. On NEC, I think it's unlikely that any of the private developers are gonna come forward and give over plots of land for self-build. Therefore, we'd probably be looking towards the local authority to have it within their plans to allocate some land towards, towards that. Um, however, that said, that hasn't been decided yet and that, that'll be a decision that uh, members will have to consider as part of this area action plan and, and future uh, development sites. Thanks, Julian. And of course, you know, I, I'm sure most people have picked up on this, but as the city council is both a, a landowner and also um, part of the, the planning service developing the AAP, there are a number of different routes into how we explore some of these issues. It's not always just through the planning framework. Sometimes it is through the council as developer itself. Just a, a question, another question which has come from, from social media around community safety. 
will paths for walking and running have properly working street lights so it feels safe to exercise in the mornings and the evenings when it's dark and I think Julian Sykes you maybe could talk to this one Julian you are mute it would help to put myself <laughs> um yes happy to respond to this question um again community safety is uh, of high importance and we're, we're we're producing a topic paper on this area um, we're doing this in collaboration with community safety teams at the uh at both councils and with the police um to to think about all these related considerations but i think that the place to start with is on, in, with placemaking um central to placemaking it is is to um, provide a, a layout with, with as much natural surveillance as possible and clear areas where, where people are private and public areas where people can um, know, know where they should be and understand um, where they are in, in terms of the, the layout. Inevitably though, there will be some quieter areas. We're looking to link in the, this area with um, neighbouring areas via um, foot and cycle bridges and underpasses and so we will look in, in those areas to at um, appropriate lighting for those areas what, what sort of additional activities we can generate there uh, and if needs be even things like cctv in, in particular cases but that will try and be that the last resort wherever we want to we want to try and get as much natural surveillance as possible so it is of, of, of high importance thank you julian just a follow up on schools and this has come up as well in other um, forums around the secondary school provision with so many new people do we re are we really sure that we won't need a secondary school on the site right now and i know there's a lot of work being going on here um matt do you want to speak to this yeah so school place planning is quite a challenge because obviously school roles vary significantly and they tend to go up and down and um, we've got to look at schools as a, as a broader catchment, really. So um, what we can't do is have school roles drop in one of the existing schools um, and then you provide a new school somewhere else because that will just, uh, again, uh, reduce roles further across the existing school. So the projections are showing that actually school roles will be maintained at around the same levels and therefore we probably won't need a new secondary school despite the population increase for the area through new development. However, um, because we're obviously looking uh, and planning quite a way ahead, the AAP plans for the next 20 years, um, we realise there might be some uncertainty in, that, in those projections. And therefore, for good proper planning purposes, we're setting aside land sufficient to accommodate a secondary school should the need arise in terms of we get a growth elsewhere in terms of school place numbers and there is pressure on the existing um, secondary schools to take the children that arise from the new development at NEC and we can look at providing new facility here that can serve the wider area as well. And I think that that point about the plans being subject to obviously evolving as time goes on is a really important one because this is a 20 year plan and it, the world is going to look very different in 20 years than it does today. So we are really trying to build in flexibility to the plan. And one of the things that's been raised often is COVID and that is very much something whose impact we're keeping under review. And I'm, I'm sure that the next iteration of the plan will take into account some of the emerging evidence around how COVID is changing demand and, and the way that people indeed want to live. So yeah. it, is a, it is an evolving situation here, isn't it, Matt? Yeah, in and, and particular around community facilities as well, because, um, you know, normally we have this nice list of types of different types of community facilities that people wish and we've got a standardized format for a new library and a new um, community center and things like that. But under a new uh, with COVID-19 um, and social distancing provision and all the other things, we're having to really rethink um, what type of community facilities we would provide should we be in this situation for the long term. And so we've got a sort of watching brief at the moment because we really don't know. And, and we need to um, remain quite flexible, I think, for not just now, but for the long term in terms of um, 
ensuring that what facilities we put on a fit for purpose comply with government policy at the time on distancing or, or other measures. And um, yeah, it could be quite unique moving forward as to how, how those existing, how our, our new provision of community facilities um, emerges in terms of a, a different model even, in terms of how you might access um, uh, services and other things. We just don't know at this point in time. So it's, yeah. yeah. And I, and I know that Emma Davis and her sustainability policy has also been talking about flexibility of buildings to be adapted over time as well. So it might start as one thing, but as things change, you know, it may well get converted. A question's just been asked about um, the uh, entertainment sites. Cambridge Junction, Light Cinemas, Bowling in the South and Corn Exchange View in the centre areas serve well for those areas, but are there plans to promote such commercial entertainment sites as part of this development to benefit existing and future North Cambridge populations? I think maybe Julian, you were going to answer this one. Thank you, Hannah. Um, this, is, this is a question that's been given a, a, a lot of thought in, in, in this area. Um, it, it relates to a, a number of different strands of pieces of, of work. Um, in terms of some of the corporate strategies, particularly that the, the city council has had in promoting um, the more cultural type facilities, um, I, I, the, the advice has been coming to, to generally try and focus those together and create a, uh, a center of activity. But the, as part of that uh, sort of growing strategy, um, they do need to have support facilities for people, to, to, uh, sort of the new, to, new and testing out their their, their skills and um, uh, try, sort of entry level to 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 um, uh, artistic activities. So there should be, and I would envisage there will be meeting places and activities for probably more smaller scale, more appropriate to the scale of the size of this area. The, the other aspect that comes to mind that's particularly relevant to this is that we are we're looking at trying to, um, as we've said previously, about managing the, the, the traffic flows into the area. It's not practical really to, to have large numbers of people coming for cars, which is often the case with many um, commercial large scale um, leisure activities. Uh, it may be possible you could organise something if it could be demonstrated that it worked around public transport. Um, but it's, I think it would be a challenge to have many facilities in this. So there's possibly not the right, um, the right location for some of those activities. What we do need to do is make sure that there are good um, public transport links to where those facilities are in the city so that people have access to those sort of things. So there will be facilities in this area of that thing probably more on a smaller scale. Thanks Julian. Just to let everybody know we've just got five minutes left so if you've been desperate to ask a question that hasn't been answered so far please do just type it in the chat because we've probably got time for one or two more and we'll share some slides in a minute that show the dates of future webinars which will you can join on different topics and we've also got a sort of general one at the end of the series uh, and also the different ways that you can comment on the consultation so please please do comment on the consultation. It's so important to us that we hear from a great range of voices here. We know that we will get uh, answers and comments back in from the development industry and from the statutory kind of authorities and consultees who, who we must consult with. But we also really, really want to hear from just everybody who lives in and around the area, the villages around the north and, and so forth as well, um, so that we hear both what you are really supportive of because that helps us strengthen the case for those parts of the action plan and also the things where we could be improving or, or taking a different tack. So those details should hopefully be up on screen for you now and, and you can obviously see them all on our website as well. Consultation ends on the 5th of October so you have just about a month to get your comments in. Just a, a follow up on the local worker housing question. Um, Julie is, is giving a masterclass on how to apply for housing and who's eligible and so forth. There's a question around who would qualify for local worker housing. Is it just nurses and teachers or other people as well? Okay, thank you. Um, so local worker housing, I think, potentially gets confused with key worker housing and they are quite 
they are slightly different. So when people talk about key worker housing, then it is generally your, your nurses, your teachers, the, the police, etc., the public sector workers. Um, but I think um, we're also very keen in terms of promoting, as I said previously, sort of the, the, the work, the travel to work, so local workers. Um, government did start to call them essential local workers, but I think our feeling is that everybody who works locally is essential to some service or other. Um, so I think within who qualifies, I think what we, it hasn't been set in stone, but I think what we will be looking at is um, looking at sort of a radius of where people work rather than what they do. And then obviously whether they qualify for affordable housing in terms of their income levels. So we're, we're looking in terms of the affordable prioritizing potentially people who work locally, but there may also be um, opportunities to look at the key worker sector. We know that people who work in Addenbrookes, um, a lot of their staff can't access the, the housing market either. They have recruitment issues. And I think with COVID-19, you know, it's really come to the fore with some of these key worker, um, sort of what they do for, for the whole of the public, really, from the care sector to nurses and everything. So I think there are opportunities to look at that as well in terms of um, prioritising housing. Nothing set in stone, but we will be looking at that based on the evidence and demand at the time. Thank you very much, Julie. That's really helpful. And, and I believe there has been some discussion about potential um, sort of block lease arrangements and things like that, haven't there, at North East Cambridge with some of the more major employers? Yeah, so, so I think potentially um, we haven't really talked about sort of build to rent schemes, but um, there is an acknowledgement that there, there will be um, demand for bespoke build to rent schemes on the site as well and, and they can actually offer opportunities for sort of block leasing from employees as well so that's definitely something that we're open to to have a discussion on going forwards. Thank you Julie. So I'm aware that we're, our time's about up now um, thank you so much for some really great questions um, on the topic. We're really glad that you've all joined us and we hope you, you found it useful. There is a little survey that will come up after the webinar ends. And if you have any comments on the format or anything else, please, please do let us know via that. Um, do fill in the consultation, as I mentioned, um, and we hope to feedback, but we will obviously feedback on the comments that we get in from that consultation once we've had time to digest them. We know that we've already been getting quite a lot in, so that's brilliant, but we, we really do want that great spread. So thanks again, and please do join us at another webinar coming up shortly. Thank you.